Hello, my name's Alan Denton, and in this physical partners video, we're going to look at upwards forces, the names of them, what causes those forces, and some of the misconceptions that students have and methods that we can use to overcome those. So let's consider the first one, which is just literally, why does an object not fall through the table? Or why does this pen not fall through my hand? There's weight acting downwards. We're not considering the, any other forces today except for the forces that are acting upwards. So what's that force called? Well, I'm going to call it a normal contact force. It might also be called a support force or a reaction force. There are some issues with the word reaction force. It can set up a misconception around Newton's third law. If you're interested in that, please watch the physics partners video about the Newton's third laws. But I'm going to call it a normal contact force. Contact, because it needs to be touching. A normal, because of the direction that it acts. It doesn't always act upwards. It always acts perpendicular to the surface that it's touching. So for example, if we consider a box here, that box is on a slope where there is still a normal contact force acting at 90 degrees to that slope. So normal contact force doesn't have to act upwards. At the moment, that box is about to slide down the slope. So in the real world, there's probably going to be some friction acting as well. And if we want to consider all of the forces acting, um, then we can draw those on as well. What we mustn't do is we mustn't get it confused with upthrust. And I've lost count of the number of times when I've seen people that have described that force acting upwards as an upthrust. It's not. Upthrust is a different thing. So let's have a look at that now. So upthrust can affect anything that's floating in a liquid or a gas. So anything that's floating in a fluid. I mean, it doesn't have to be floating, it could be sinking actually as well, but anything that's within a fluid. So uh, some examples that we're likely to use are balloons. There they've got an up thrust from the air around them, uh, a ship floating on the top of some water, or even a submarine that's underwater. All three of those have got up thrust. It's also known as buoyancy. And it's caused because there is a pressure difference acting upwards from underneath and from above pushing down. So I've got a challenge for you. I've told you that the up thrust is caused when you displace a fluid. The actual size of that up thrust is equal to the weight of the fluid that you have displaced. So we've got four tennis balls, A, B, C and D. Ignore whether they're moving or not. But you can see what A is in the air, B is floating on the surface, C is underwater and D is further underwater than that. E is at the same level as C, but instead of being made out of a tennis ball, it's made out of some lump of metal. So I'll, I'll, we'll call it a lump of lead. Read through the question, have a think about what's going on, pause the video, and then I'll explain some answers. Okay, you will notice that the ball that's got the smallest up thrust is A. That's because the only thing it's displacing is the air. B is displacing some water and some air, so that's got a slightly bigger force. C, D and E all have the same up thrust because they're all displacing the same volume, the same mass of water. In fact, normally on this diagram you wouldn't even draw uh, the force at A because actually the up thrust from the air is insignificant compared to the weight of that ball. So why does the heavy ball sink? Well, we've only considered the up thrusts, and when you consider weight as well, then you have a more complicated picture. So we can also use the word buoyancy to describe up thrust. It's always acting upwards, and it often gets confused with air resistance, water resistance, or lift. Okay, so let's have a look at air resistance. So air resistance, also known as drag, and related to the idea of water resistance as well, but is when an object is moving in comparison to the air that's around it. So that parachute that's falling is falling faster than the air around it, so it's bashing in to those particles in the air. That cyclist, she's cycling faster 
than the air that she's going towards. So she feels an air resistance pushing her backwards. So it's not always upwards. Interestingly, it changes in an odd way. If you end up going twice as fast, you hit twice as many particles and the momentum change of each of those particles is twice as much. So actually you end up with four times the air pressure. Air resistance must not be confused with up thrust or lift. So lift can be caused by a plane's wing or the rotor on a helicopter, or in fact, um, the blades of a turbine spinning around on a wind turbine, for example. And it's caused by faster moving air having a lower pressure. So in this very simple demo, before we convince our students how lift works in an airplane wing, I'm going to blow between the middle of these two cans. The faster moving air here should mean that there's a lower pressure in the middle and you can see what happens. So the pressure on the outside, the high pressure on the outside, pushes them in together. So lift is caused by something with a really specific shape moving through the air that causes one part to have a high pressure, one part to have a lower pressure, and that causes it to lift upwards. And it's not to be confused with up thrust or air resistance. We could also think about the thrust of a rocket, for example. How does a rocket work? It's not the same as the lift of an aeroplane. A rocket works in space, whereas an aeroplane wing wouldn't. So how does the rocket work? Well, it links to Newton's third law. The rocket pushes down on some air particles, which means the air particles are pushing up on that rocket. So this one doesn't have to be acting upwards. And there are other examples too. So we could look at the tension. So here, this is being held up by tension. And in this example, I've got a toy where one of the discs is being held up. It's actually being held up by magnetism. If I put another disc on the top, you can see that. So it's being held up by magnetism. And there are many other examples too. So I've talked a lot about the different names of those forces and the different causes of those different forces, but I haven't mentioned how we can teach about them. And the truth is that we need to teach about them lots and lots of times to the students and to try and use a different set of approaches until we know that it's sunk in. So we might use testing, um, for example, Socrative. I'm a huge fan of using mini whiteboards and getting them to draw those forces on there. So this activity can work really nicely. If you prepare them in advance, you can give students some printouts of photos and then a series of kind of cut out arrows, which means they, they can work in a small group as they're trying to figure out what the different forces are. And for example, in this one, you might say, well, actually, if they've been reached their terminal velocity, the force up and down are balanced, but actually you can explore how, you know, initially, the force upwards, the air resistance is small, but as you increase your velocity, the upwards force, the air resistance increases. Um, here's another example where we're talking about the forces acting on a rocket ship as it's taking off. So we've got the thrust upwards, we've got the weight down. What's really interesting is when it starts off actually, the force upwards, the thrust, is not much bigger than the weight downwards. But as it gets faster and faster and faster, the weight goes down because of course it's using up its fuel. So actually it's acceleration increases as it's going up. And you have to take also into account the fact that there's air resistance and that as you get faster, the air resistance increases, which makes it really quite complicated. One could almost say it is rocket science. I hope that's been a help in teaching this subject. We've only considered the forces acting on one object, whereas of course those forces are caused by something else. If you're interested in how these forces work together, Newton's third law pairs, then please watch our other video. Thanks for watching.